You are listening to the Dark Fantastic Podcast. Welcome to this new episode of the Dark Fantastic Podcast. I'm AK and I've got many things lined up for you and a great guest. So stay tuned and let's begin. I want to talk a little bit about classic literature and what constitutes so-called fine literature because recently and maybe in the last 30-40 years there has been this trend going on about re-examining a lot of the literature that came out in the Victorian and Edwardian uh, eras. They are basically being re-examined according to today's standards. And so they have been found quote-unquote lacking in, in many respects. But I have to say that it's important to note that styles change, politics develop, and cultures go through a lot of different mood swings, meaning that a book written 20, 30 years ago automatically clashes with today's mainstream thinking or or uh, or mainstream standards. But one thing that hasn't changed in the past 50 years is deeming a certain class of novels dated. And again, I point out the fact that the brand of, of literature that is most under attack uh, is basically novels that came out in the Victorian and Edwardian eras. It is true that novels of the of the Victorian and Edwardian ages, for example, have their faults and show their age in, in many of their attitudes, like depictions of women and, uh, and non-Western cultures, for instance. But the idea that or, or literature should, should be eternally compatible with contemporary standards is just, I think, ludicrous. Because, again, there are some books that were published not a hundred years ago, not ninety years ago, but ten years ago, twenty years ago, that if you read now, they are just so outdated in their ideas and attitudes and even style. If you read books, especially books that are considered quote-unquote literary fiction and uh, win a lot of awards, if you read some of, of, of these books now, some of them hold up for sure, but a lot of them actually don't hold up. What, what, the kind of books that actually hold up are books that are considered genre books and books that are considered maybe by some circles less than. And that's, of course, another argument, but... I'm just trying to point out that the idea of categorization and putting labels on, on, on books is not a very constructive idea. I'm going to go back to books that were published or written in the Victorian and Edwardian eras because, in my opinion, and as a voracious reader and as a writer myself, I can't deny the influence, beauty, importance, and value of 
hundreds if not thousands of books that came out of those eras. Those eras produced some of the most humane and elegant and transformative fiction ever written. Some of these books that I'm talking about are still praised and are still admired even by people in the academic circles and uh, critical circles. Dickens, for example, is, who is unquestionably a master craftsman, is still revered to this day. Part of it is that he wrote so beautifully and he was uh, the consummate wordsmith and his books have universal themes and have great characters and many of his stories are, uh, are very entertaining and are very unputdownable even by today's standards. But also, I think part of the reason that Dickens is so revered to this day is because of his, what I deem his flaws, to be honest, uh, is uh, in that Dickens' voice was actually somewhat loud. His sentiments and his reliance on sentimentality was very strong, um, I think. And also, what many academics think is part of the reason why his books remain so important, I think, is that his politics were very populist. He, he always appealed to the idea that more change uh, is needed in terms of uh, improving the conditions of the poor and improving working conditions and uh, and uh, giving uh, workers more rights and uh, ending child labor, which of course are all very uh, admirable ideas. And he did affect uh, some of of of, uh, of those uh, changes by his fiction, but. Not to the extent, I think, that uh, a lot of modern scholars uh, claim he actually did. So we need to give someone like Dickens his due, but at the same time, I think he is overrated in, 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 in many respects. Uh, because recently, for example, I was rereading uh, Great Expectations, which is considered one of his most popular and maybe one of his best books. And to be honest, I found it a, a very good example of books that came out of the Victorian and Edwardian ages that have dated very badly because the characters and, and great expectations are so over the top and the, the, the emotions are so overheated and the, the, the sentimentality I think is, is through the roof in, in that book and so I found it not as entertaining as, as other books of his for example like Bleak House and A Tale of Two Cities and some of his short stories so I think again it's, it's, uh, it's a bit strange that that uh, that Dickens for example is so revered and someone like Henry James for example who 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 said a lot and who really delved into the human condition and wrote about death and life and marriage and and materialism and uh, and, and a lot of things that are valid to this day and uh, his books even his 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 lesser books, I think, still have the, the 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 that power to actually move you and transport you in a more realistic way, in a more naturalistic way than Dickens. I think Dickens 
was there was artifice in his writing and there was this you you always felt reading Dickens that although his books uh, were um, many times they, they, they were heartfelt and very well written and, and very well crafted but you always felt that he was playing to the masses a bit uh, but Henry James for example someone again who isn't as as revered and studied and and promoted as Dickens, never really played to the masses. His books are much more complex. His books are, I think, more timeless than the books of Dickens. And uh, I think Henry James called Charles Dickens the best of the superficial writers. And, and I think I have to agree. But... Who knows why academics and critics choose some writers and ignore others? For example, what about Anthony Trollope? Anthony Trollope was a master of sociopolitical satire, and uh, his books uh, dealt with politics and the, the, and he examined the lives of the rich and the poor and the contrast between them and the friction between them. And he talked a lot about organized religion and he wasn't a fan of organized religion as far as, as, as I could tell. But again, you don't hear a lot about Trollope nowadays. You don't hear a lot about uh, the masterpiece that is the warden. You don't hear a lot about the claverings. You don't hear... Uh, a lot about Dr. Thorne and uh, the BBC, I think, uh, did uh, radio adaptations and uh, and TV adaptations, but he isn't treated as seriously as someone maybe like Hemingway uh, or again like Dickens or again like Jane Austen. But in my opinion, Trollope, and I and I know this sound uh, this will will sound blasphemous but Trollope I think is a better writer than all of, 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 of these writers because Trollope maybe wasn't as as um, as as masterful a craftsman as someone like Dickens for example but Trollope was actually much more subtle and, and, and much more elegant when he when he talked about the human condition and about and, when, and about politics and society and and uh, and the excesses of of the Victorian society and and the the excesses of the aristocracy, for example, uh, I love Trollope, and uh, even though I acknowledge that his writing is is flawed, and again some of of his books have have aged better than others, but I always wonder why someone like Trollope isn't. As, as discussed more or, or discussed widely as many other so-called fine writers or writers of fine literature. I think also it's important to talk about what is called genre literature. Another writer, for example, that you don't hear a lot about now is... Gaston Leroux, the, the writer of Phantom of the Opera and The Mystery of the Yellow Room and The Secret of the Night, he's one of the most influential writers when, when it comes to detective fiction. But you don't hear a lot about him now. Is, isn't he considered a good writer? Aren't his books good literature? What about... Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Aside from the hundreds of movies and TV shows that have reimagined and reshaped Sherlock Holmes almost beyond recognition, is Doyle discussed now in the study halls of Harvard or Oxford or Brown? And uh, if not, why? And let's not forget the granddaddy of horror, Bram Stoker, whose masterpiece, Dracula, is now under the knife of a lot of naysayers, 
with movies and TV shows portraying him as portraying Dracula, I mean, as, as a romantic anti-hero and Van Helsing as some sort of Puritan villain. So, are the Phantom of the Opera and Dracula and A Study in Scarlet and The Hound of the Baskervilles and Around the World in 80 Days and The Invisible Man, are, are these good books? Are these part of what is called fine literature? I happen to think so. I happen to believe that fiction is, first and foremost, about telling a story and telling it well. It should transport you, it should rouse you, it should delight you, move you, and when possible, it should inform you and even enlighten you. But it's not necessary, I think, for every book and every story to preach or inform or transform. And I think those who think that don't really love stories for their own sake. I think they think of stories as some sort of vehicle through which a moral can be taught or an ideology can be promoted. And I think that books that focus almost exclusively on morality or focus almost exclusively on politics or ideology, I think these books actually don't age very well. Uh, if you read now a lot of books that were considered you know, uh, impassioned, politically viable and, and socially conscious books that came from the 60s and 70s, they are, most of them, unreadable now. The same goes for books that, again, were supposed to be socially or politically valid, uh, that came from the 18th century or 19th century or early 20th century, these books, again, most of them are almost unreadable now and have dated very, very badly. I think the books that have aged very, very well and I think the books that have stood the test of time and still delight readers to this day and still can be read and enjoyed by readers of any age group are so-called genre books or books that deal with the fantastic or books that are somewhat apolitical or, or, or whose politics are subtle and 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 uh, and are written in a way that is so elegant so subdued that they don't shout at you personally when i pick up a book by conan doyle i don't really think about him being a royalist or a spiritualist when i'm in the middle of an hg wells story i don't think about his socialism i just lose myself in the tale I think I've talked about this topic enough, so I leave it for someone far more eloquent than myself to have the final word about what makes a book fine and what con is considered fine literature and is there really someone who, who, who has the qualifications to, to say what is fine literature and what isn't. So here is an excerpt from G.K. Chesterton's essay, A Defense of Penny Dreadfuls, in which he discusses the notion of what makes good literature. Chesterton says, The simple need for some kind of ideal world in which fictitious persons play an unhampered part is infinitely deeper and older 
than the rules of good art, and much more important. Chesterton goes on to say, Literature and fiction are two entirely different things. Literature is a luxury. Fiction is a necessity. It is the modern literature of the educated, not of the uneducated, which is aggressively criminal. At the very instant that we curse the penny dreadful for encouraging thefts upon property, we canvass the proposition that all property is theft. At the very instant that we charge it with encouraging the young to destroy life, we are placidly discussing whether life is worth preserving. My guest on this episode is one of my literary heroes, and the reason I am an avid fan of Sherlock Holmes. He is a recognized authority on Sherlock Holmes, and has written numerous novels and two plays featuring the detective. He is also the co-editor of D.K.'s The Sherlock Holmes Book, arguably the definitive book on the detective. He has also written a number of other novels and stories, including his Johnny One Eye series and the Paul Snow series, as well as several collections of ghost stories. He is also the editor of Tales of Mystery and the Supernatural, published by Wordsworth, in my opinion, the finest series of Victorian and Edwardian anthologies ever published. Please welcome David Stewart Davies. Uh, well, you've written um, several Sherlock Holmes novels, stories, plays, and uh, you are a uh, self-confessed Sherlockian. So how did your interest in Holmes begin? Well, it's a well-told story, but uh, I have to go back to my school days. Um, around about the age of 12, I think it was, um, two things happened. Um, I was in the school library and I encountered a copy of The Hound of the Baskervilles uh, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And at the same time, the local TV station was showing the old Basil Rathbone films. And so I saw those as well. So the combination of the book and the series uh, was so magic to me that I was sold into Sherlockian slavery um, ever since. And, and Sherlock Holmes has been a big part of my life since then. Um, and obviously, once having read The Hound, I devoured the rest of the uh, Doylean canon. And, and the thing was that having read all the stories, I wanted more. And like so many people since, um, if you want more Sherlock Holmes, and obviously Conan Doyle is not around to write them, um, you have a go at writing them yourself. And that's how I, I started in a very small way, becoming uh, a writer of Sherlock Holmes stories. So were you uh, were you interested in in, um, in writing other in other genres before you started writing uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes stories? Yes and no. I mean, even at a very early age, uh, I was interested in creating stories. Um, I used to. Uh, my mother was a big reader. My father wasn't a reader at all, but my mother was a big reader, and I used to ask her. I'm talking when I was about eight, eight years old or nine years old. I used to ask her, would she like me to write her a story? And she always said, yeah, well, that'd be lovely. Yes, David. Um, and then I'd say, what kind of story? Do you want a, a, a cowboy story or a detective story or a horror story? And I can't remember now what, what uh, her responses were particularly, but I tended to write uh, stories for my mum to read. And I was particularly keen on, obviously, um, adventure stories, but also horror stories. I like ghost stories, and I still do. I mean, I do write um, supernatural fiction as well. So uh, you were a teacher at, at a high school for 20 years before, I guess, before you became a full-time writer, right? That's right. I was, uh, I'd had, I think, two 
two books published uh, while I was teaching. And then, and I was contributing to uh, a magazine called uh, the Sherlock Holmes Gazette uh, as, a, as a contributing writer. And then the editor of that magazine had decided to move elsewhere. And so the publisher offered me the job of editor uh, of the magazine, which I later changed the title to, to call it uh, Sherlock magazine. And the opportunity to become an editor, although the, the salary was certainly far less than I was getting in teaching, certainly gave me the opportunity to leave teaching and try my hand at full-time writing. And that's uh, something like uh, 25 years ago now. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Tangled Skin. Well, I think it was the first uh, the first book I I read uh, written by you. I uh, I was familiar with your name as uh, as the person who edited the uh, the uh, details of mystery and the supernatural. Yeah. Because I, I think I bought most of them when they came out. Um, and uh, this was the first original piece of fiction uh, written by you that I read, and I was, uh, and I was really, really, really into that into the, into that novel. I liked it very much, and it was the first time I um, the first time I, I read a story that had more or less a supernatural aspect to it. I mean, a Sherlock Holmes story. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I liked it very much and I liked how playful uh, it was but I have to ask you since uh, for a Sherlockian like yourself pitting Holmes against such a supernatural uh, foe is somewhat of an unusual choice well it's a combination of things really Um, first of all I would say that although um, there are no supernatural stories uh, in the Conan Doyle canon, um, he himself did write quite a lot of very exciting short stories featuring the supernatural. Um, and one thing about The Hound of the Baskervilles, which to some extent The Tangle of Skein is a sequel to, um, for a certain amount of time, Conan Doyle plays with the reader and you wonder, actually, is there a phantom hound on Dartmoor, or is it the work of uh, evil men or man? Um, And that's why the novel is so successful, because initially you wonder, you know, Mr. Holmes, there were footprints of a gigantic hound. You wonder if it is, in fact, a supernatural being. Obviously, Holmes um, reveals that it's a a man-made mystery. But so... There was an element of wonder whether there was a, a supernatural touch to that story. But at the same time, I was a great fan of the Dracula, the book, and in particular, the Hammer versions of, of Dracula, the, uh, the, the Dracula original with Christopher Lee and uh, a kind of sequel, The Brides of Dracula, with Peter Cushing reprising his role as Van Helsing. And I thought the idea of Van Helsing um, uh, working with Sherlock Holmes to to uh, some extent would be quite interesting and exciting. And all in all my Holmes fiction, and I've written nine novels now, I've always wanted to introduce a slightly extra element to the uh, to the to the mix. Because otherwise, if I just did an absolute copycat Conan Doyle, um, it would be just a a copycat Conan Doyle with no element of David Stuart Davis in it. So I I tried to do something different. And I I thought the, you know, Holmes always has to have a a master foe. uh, And what better foe than Count Dracula, as in The Tangles Came? So it, it, to me, it was a sort of Sherlock Holmes meets Hammer films. And it was a great joy to write, great fun to write. And the nice thing about it, as you probably know, um, Peter Cushing did an introduction to it in which he says, if this was made into a film, uh, and sadly it hasn't been yet, if this was made into a film, 
I wouldn't know which part I would want to play, either Sherlock Holmes or Van Helsing. So that was a great compliment to me, I thought. Um, he was, I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Mr. Cushing on more than one occasion and the original publication, uh, he, I went down to his uh, the place where he lived, not his actual house, but his secretary's house where I, I met him. Uh, and he signed 50 copies hardback copies of the first edition um, and uh, they were snapped up very quickly as you can imagine um, well um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the best of Sherlock Holmes the, the volume you edited all right um, it, it was my first introduction to uh, my very first introduction to the Conan Doyle stories of course Everybody knows Sherlock Holmes, and, and I'd seen some of the movies, and uh, maybe even I'd come across a couple of stories in, in in anthologies. But my first true introduction to uh, to um, you, you know reading for leisure, reading Conan Doyle for leisure was your book, was the book you edited, and to this day it's one of my favorite books, and I've uh, and I've read several other or sampled several other Sherlock Holmes uh, anthologies and compendiums and I still go back to your book because I think it features uh, every every color of story that, uh, that Doyle wrote and uh, and I think it's uh, it's representative of, of all all, all the range all his range of, uh, of stories uh, of Sherlock Holmes stories so uh, I have to ask you, um, how did you go about such an impossible task <laughs> as, as selecting uh, the quote-unquote best stories? Well, I, I think really uh, when it comes down to it, the honest truth is my, my favourites. Um, <laughs> but I did try and, and, and encompass um, the various elements within the Sherlock Holmes stories the mysteries, the villains, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the mysteries, the villains, the interplay between Holmes and Watson in some of the stories and so forth. And I was also uh, influenced to some extent because Conan Doyle himself brought out a list of his favourite stories um, in about 1926, which I, I didn't copy exactly, but I looked at the stories from that list and, and chose the ones which I thought um, were the best. At this date, because it's quite a while since I did the book, I, I can't remember the full list of stories now, but obviously you, you did go for um, the ones that a lot of people remember, even if they're not Sherlockians, like the uh, Speckled Band, for example, and the Blue Carbuncle. Um, so, yeah, that, that, well, that's very nice of you thought that that was a, a great selection. Um, as I said Initially, it's a lot of it was down to what I liked myself. I want to move on to uh, something I came across uh, recently, uh, and I was very fortunate to actually dis discover this when I was <clears throat> uh, reading up uh, on you, and it is the uh, the, the the Roger Llewellyn uh, one one man act play, oh, right. uh, Sherlock Holmes: The Last Act. Uh, which uh, thankfully is now available as an audiobook for, pe for, for people who didn't have the chance, like myself, to watch the original run. So I listened to it and uh, I, was, uh, I, I enjoyed it very much, but I was also taken aback by it because it's very different than, uh, than, your, uh, the, than your Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, like The Shadow of the Rat and The Tangled Skein and, and others. It's very, very different. And uh, I want to uh, read you just a small qu a quote uh, from, from, from that play. Uh, um, I think during the second act, or maybe the, the, by the end of the first, Sherlock Holmes says, I am a soulless, loveless man, a thinking machine. That's quite a startling statement. Well, the I think... Um, obviously, <laughs> it's turned my mind. I think the fact that I'm an automaton um, is actually 
from the from Conan Doyle himself. A soulless, loveless man is probably me. Um, but you've got to remember that <clears throat> that um, that uh, the the play is it's a play, <clears throat> and you have to increase the drama and the emotion uh, for a theatre audience rather than the reader. And as it being a a one man play, um, you've got to uh, investigate the character and. Uh, he's talking to himself all the way through the play, as you know, um, and uh, taking on the roles of the other characters and exposing his inner thoughts. Um, the premise of the play, as you know, is that Holmes has come back from Watson's funeral and realises there are an awful lot of things that he wanted to tell Watson when he was alive, but failed to do so. And... It's almost like a therapy session as he goes through his thoughts about their time together, his life, and um, demonstrating some of the inner dark thoughts that he had uh, bottled up within him that he never actually said to Watson. And of course, he's not actually saying them to Watson now. He's saying them to himself. So as I say, it's a kind of therapy session. I enjoyed it very, very much, and I look forward to listening to the uh, the other one you did, the uh, the life and death. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's but it is a very different take on, on Holmes. I've I've never, I don't think I've seen this uh, th this version of Holmes before, and I think that's what makes the play fascinating because it's a side of 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 Sherlock that that wasn't even addressed in, in this same manner, even in the recent BBC series. So, um, so I liked it very much and, and, uh, and I recommend it to uh, Sherlock Holmes fans everywhere. It's available. Uh, ev I think it's available very easily. Now you can get it on, on CD and it's streaming on, on several uh, uh, platforms. So uh, I highly recommend it. The, the thing is, if you haven't, uh, experience the second play that is very very different as well um i it really gave me a, <clears throat> excuse me gave me an opportunity to experiment with the notion that um you know that conan doyle wanted to kill sherlock holmes because he he thought he was interfering with his literary career and i took that idea uh one step beyond <clears throat> excuse me so there is a kind of almost supernatural element introduced into the play where Sherlock Holmes and, in fact, Moriarty become real characters briefly. Uh, I, I can't explain it any clearer without giving too much of the game away, but I think it is a, a very interesting idea um, about the relationship between Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle, Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes, and... The title that you mentioned is, is actually called The Death and Life of Sherlock Holmes because it involves his death and, if you like, his resurrection in literary form. Um, I better not say any more, but I, I'll be interested to, if you get hold of a copy of the, uh, uh, the CD to, uh, to hear what you think of it. Uh, I, it to me, it's a very pleasing uh, play for me to see on stage. And the actor Roger Llewellyn, um, who obviously was in the first play as well, was quite brilliant in bringing it to life. Yeah, it's it's uh, it was great, and uh, it was a very pleasant surprise because I thought I knew um, um, most of, of 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 what you what you wrote. So uh, it was a very pleasant surprise that I had to. I uh, had two plays to, to, to enjoy, so I look forward to listening to The Death and Life as well. And uh, hopefully uh, you write another one in, uh, down, well, uh, down the road. Uh, I have written another one. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it uh, it was, uh, had a, a run in, uh, I've got to be careful now, 90, in the spring of 1990, 2019, let's say, um, in Edinburgh. Um, and it's uh, Sherlock Holmes' a final resolution. It's a two-hander. There's Dr. Watson in it and 
um, Sherlock, uh, and it just ran for a week in Edinburgh with a, an absolutely brilliant actor called Michael Daviot, who um, played Holmes. And uh, again, it's a different take on the notion of the Holmes and Watson relationship and so forth. It got very good reviews, but unfortunately, um, it's very difficult to get plays put on these days, particularly now with the pandemic. So it's, it's lying there in, uh, in a drawer, the, the script, um, waiting for someone to say, I'll put it on for you. Um, you, you appreciate that as a writer, you, you, you pro provide the material for, for publishers and for theatre people, but you, they have to then take up the, uh, the slack and, and uh, do it. They have to publish the work as a book or they have to put your play on as a stage. And the writer has no power uh, to, uh, to influence that at all, unfortunately. So there is a oh. third play, um, and it's called Sherlock Holmes, The Final Resolution. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great news. And uh, I hope that um, at least one day it will, uh, I hope it, it, will, it will run again on, on stage. Yeah. But I also hope that it will be available also as an audio drama, like your other two plays down the line, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, that's, the, f for me, and I think for, for, for lots of people, uh, the idea of, of, uh, of a play uh, being uh, produced as an audio drama and available easily to buy or stream is just wonderful. It's just this kind of accessibility is, is wonderful. Uh, after the, the play, of course, has, has had its run because yeah. seeing it live is, is of course, is the, is the thing. Well, uh, the nice thing about uh, audio version is uh, it really concentrates uh, the reader, the listener rather, on the words. Um, when a, a play is on stage, you, there's so much to take in, the, the movement of the actor, the scenery and, and all that sort of thing. But when you're listening to a, an audio version, you are concentrating on the words. And for a writer, that's uh, the tops, you know. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time so i just have two more questions that's fine okay. um uh the first one is uh you write in in different genres and you write not just about sherlock holmes you have other uh, types of stories detective stories and, and ghost stories so uh and people can visit your website to 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 check those out yeah uh but i want to ask you about what what you're working on now Right. Well, um, two things, I think. Here we go. This is the latest um, book that is coming out in January. Uh, it's a new yeah. book by, on, from the Titan Publishing House called uh, Sherlock Holmes, Revenge from the Grave. So that, that's a, a yeah. new Sherlock. Um, I've got a collection of ghost stories coming out in America in November called uh, In the Shadows. Uh, and these are sort of weird, mysterious little stories. So In the Shadows is the title. And I've just got confirmation that the book I did about Jeremy Brett, um, uh, which sort of went out of print over 10 years ago and has been being charged fantastic fees on the internet because it's so rare is now being republished at a reasonable price and will be available in November uh, on Amazon.com. Um, from the point of view of non-Sherlock Holmes, I've got a, a, another detective story coming out in March. This is in America again, uh, with a new detective called Rupert Wilde. And he's set in 1920s England. And he has uh, uh, an Indian associate, a sort of Dr. Watson character, a young, educated Indian who uh, accompanies, uh, accompanies him on his cases. And uh, the first one is called The Dead of Winter. So I'm keeping busy despite the uh, terrible pandemic and uh, so forth and, and 
I suppose really during this rather sad time, people are reading more because they don't get out as much or didn't anyway. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that's that's for sure. When, whenever there is, I think, uh, whenever there is, there's some sort of, of, uh, of, of catastrophe or, or dilemma or war or pandemic or, or whatever, usually people turn to books for comfort. And uh, you always see books, uh, book sales rising. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and especially, I think uh, people want to uh, escape a bit and uh, and uh, st- mystery stories and ghost stories and sherlock holmes stories they are they are uh, as well written as they are and as as uh, intellectually satisfying as they are but they are comfort food in, in some way the interesting thing about Sh- the sherlock holmes stories is that obviously originally uh, they were contemporary tales uh, exciting <clears throat> people at the time they were written and through the years they've now become almost comfort stories Let, let's return mm. to the age of the, the the fog and the handsome cab let's disappear down that rabbit hole to a, a, a different world where things were not quite as unpleasant it would seem and there was always Sherlock Holmes to solve any danger any problem any un, unhappiness that uh, may exist well, um, I think it's 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 almost impossible now to find someone a- anywhere who hasn't come across Sherlock Holmes in one way or another, in movies or cartoons or TV shows or yeah. <laughs> maybe even in a podcast. But let's imagine that. But let's imagine that you come across someone, hopefully a young person, who has never read one of the original. Sherlock Holmes stories by Conan Doyle. What would you say to them to entice them to give it a go? Well, I mean, the the two titles that I always mention to, if you like, people who say, I've never read Sherlock Holmes, what you what what which one should I look at? Obviously the Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, but that's a novel and they may not want to tackle a novel. So the other one I would recommend is uh, The Speckled Band because it has a dark mystery, a clever uh, solution and a very good relationship between Holmes and Watson and that dramatic scene in, in Baker Street where uh, the villain comes in and bends the poker. Uh, it's very dramatic, very exciting, uh, waiting in the darkness for the snake to come down the bell rope. Um, when I taught uh, at high school, um, that's one story I used to uh, read to my students. And I used to say, we, we got to the point where they're in the room at night waiting for what was going to happen, because we don't know what's going to happen at that point. And then I used to ask the students to finish the story. And it, it was a, a lovely challenge for them. And they came up with some incredible answers. But it stimulated their thoughts and it, it uh, captured some of their imaginations. I know one or two of them went on uh, to read more. And in fact, one guy went on to try and write some home stories himself. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I, um, as I said before, I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time. And uh, I hope to, to have you back on the show uh, so, sometime in the future to talk about your work as an editor uh, of the Tales of Mystery and Supernatural, which I think is just a wonderful, wonderful series. And it's still available. Uh, I just checked the Wordsworth website. They have new editions out with wonderful covers. Yeah. And uh, I would love to, 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 to dedicate uh, an episode to, to talk to you ab- about that uh, series. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for uh, for joining me on the show. Uh, and uh, you basically introduced me to Sherlock Holmes, and uh, I thank you for that. And uh, I thank you for uh, for uh, coming on the show. Well, I uh, thank you for your kindness. And as a writer, it's always a joy to hear someone saying 
what you, your your work has meant something to me, which you know is is the raison d'etre that one writes. It one doesn't write really for money. Um, <laughs> it would be a, a foolish pursuit if you did. One writes to please. Uh, to please people and to touch them in some way. So th thank you very much, Ahmed, for your kindness. And uh, uh, yeah, come to me again at some point when you feel you, you want to. So for now then, um, au revoir. <laughs> oh, it was so easy, Watson. Watson, are you asleep? Well, really. How can you hope to record my famous victories when you are lost in the arms of Morpheus? I'll be rather busy this weekend, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid you'll have to cater for yourself. Poor bumbling, befuddled Lestrade would still be pounding the beat with a truncheon were it not for me. Why are there no great crimes anymore? Where are the great challenges? Why does there appear to be a diminishing need for my talents, my considerable talents. As the shabby vessel passed directly beneath the bridge, I leapt down, my Inverness cape spreading out like the wings of an avenging angel. Now there's a good picture for that pageant fellow. Sherlock Holmes, The Death and Life. I'd like to end this episode with a clip from one of my favorite black and white B-movies. The Almost Forgotten Mystery, Inner Sanctum, that was released in 1948. It's a neat little film and a neat little mystery with a haunting twist. And I think it's perfect viewing for Halloween. And it's also readily available on many sites uh, because it's in the public domain. So if you haven't watched it yet... Give it a go this Halloween. I think you'll like it. And uh, I'd like to thank you for joining me for this episode of the Dark Fantastic Podcast. Please join me again soon. I'm too forceful. Perhaps I'm too stubborn to listen to warnings. When I do listen, in one ear, out the other. That isn't good. I could tell you of a forceful woman. She knew what she wanted and thought she knew how to get it. Sounds like me. She was warned of some danger? Yes. She was on a train. She was warned to stay on it, but in one ear, out the other. As the train pulled into the town of Clayburg, it was after nine. <laughs> The station was deserted, except for a man. He was a man trying to lead a simple, happy life. He found out life was neither simple nor happy. The girl, the girl who was warned, made his life complicated and miserable. You can't ditch me like a coward! have much opportunity to regret the unheeded warning. You've been listening to the Dark Fantastic Podcast. Flashes in the dark. Tiny stories. Vast dimensions. The killer. He opened the door and came in. A new room, a new challenge. The clue was there, the answer waiting. His mind worked as his eyes roamed. He found the key, walked towards it. The killer was here, in this house. Did they know? The detective turned around. No one there. Was it too late? No. There was still a chance. He could kill again.
Text Copyright Ahmed Khalifa 2021 Ahmed Khalifa is a filmmaker and novelist. He is the writer-director of several short films and a feature, released on Netflix, and the author of a number of novels and short stories, including, Beware the Stranger, available on Amazon.